I don't take for granted that the writing leave and the vacation of the last seven weeks is a gift that I don't deserve and therefore I want to thank God publicly and thank you and thank the elders for your generosity. May the Lord multiply the fruitfulness of that work and that rest. And it is no exaggeration as always to say it is very good to be back. This place has grown on me in the last 31 years. Let's pray. Now, Lord, we want to hear Jesus speak. Jesus is doing the talking in this text. And I would like to so open it that his voice is heard by the sheep. Make your voice compelling, Lord Jesus. Call irresistibly your sheep. We want to worship you over this text. So come, fill our hearts with a sense of reverence and worship. I ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. We're a people who worship the Lord Jesus. Let that sink in. We worship. We worship the Lord Jesus. There are places in the world where that will get you killed. We don't just admire him. We don't just swear allegiance to him. We don't just follow him. We are not just Christ followers. We worship Jesus. We worship him as God Almighty, omnipotent, eternal, never having had a beginning, all wise, creator, sustainer and redeemer of the universe. We worship Jesus as God, one with the Father, one with the Spirit. We worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. We worship Jesus. That's the context of John 10, 1 to 21. That's where Jesus is taking us again. It's where he took us in chapter 9. It's where he's taking us again. Do you remember, what, eight weeks ago now, he healed a blind man at the beginning of chapter 9. 41 verses of controversy over that. And do you remember what happened? The blind man's sight got clearer and clearer and clearer and the blindness of the Pharisees got darker and darker and darker. Verse 24, if you want to look at it, of chapter 9. The Pharisees say to the healed man, give glory to God. We know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. Then look at verse 38, the apex of the text. The healed man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. 9.38. That's what it all came down to. There is no fence sitting in the end. Blasphemy or worship. This man's a sinner. It's not God. That's one possible response right now in this room. Or, I believe. And he worshiped. That's what it all comes down to. That's what it all comes down to in life. 
in this service. There is no in-between position. You're kidding yourself. There's no fence to sit on. Blaspheme or worship, that's all there is. And so life comes down to, it's what eternity comes down to. All eternity will be blaspheming in hell or worshiping in heaven. That's all there is now. That's where we're going. Let me take you to the end of the text to show you that's where we're going. And then we'll go back and we'll get there. So let's go to verses 19 to 21, show you where we're going, where Jesus is going. He's just said some amazing things, outrageous things, crazy things, and it caused another division, which it will now. Verse 19, there was again a division among the Jews because of these words. That's what happens when Jesus talks, or I talk for him. Many of them said, he has a demon, he is insane. That's an option. Why listen to him? Verse 21, others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? That's what it all comes down to. He is insane. Or he's God. Let me show you why I think the issue comes down to insanity, which is plain in verse 20, or God, which isn't plain yet. I'll tell you where I get that. He has just said something about his power in verses 17 and 18, which leaves no fence sitting. He's either insane in the way he talks or he's God. Listen, let's read it, verse 17. For this reason the Father loves me Because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. What? Verse 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. (laughs) You're crazy! Or, now, just think a minute. Of course you have authority to lay down your life. So do you and any other mortal man who wants to jump in front of a truck or off a cliff or put yourself between a bullet and the one you love. Yes, you have that authority. But when you're dead, you're dead. You don't have the authority to undead yourself. Do you? Does anybody? This is insane. That's not an unusual response for a person to say, you kill me, I will take my life back. That's crazy. Nobody can do that. Except God in the flesh. So it all comes down to this again. It came down to this in chapter 9. It's coming down in chapter 10. It's going to come down again and again. These things are written that you may believe he's the son of the living God. Meaning he's divine. So that's where we're going. Now let's go there. So back to the beginning of the text. He's either insane or he's God, how did he get there? The text has three parts. Verses one to six, seven to 10, 11 to 18. It helps a lot to see this. Took me about 
five hours to see that. Sorry, I'm so dense, but. Verses one to six puts the Pharisees to the test again. And he calls this little unit, one to six, a figure of speech. You see that phrase in verse six? He calls it a figure of speech. A kind of parable or word picture. It's very general. There's a sheepfold, there's some sheep, there's a door, there's a shepherd, there's a gatekeeper, there's a stranger. And here's, here's the interesting thing. He does not identify himself with any of them in verses 1 to 6. This is just a general picture. He doesn't say, I'm sheep, I'm door, I'm anything. He just says, there they are. This is a test to the Pharisees. Are you blind? That's the first unit in the text. The second unit in the text is verses seven to 10, and here he does say, verse seven and verse nine, I am the door. And he tells us what that means for us, and it is so precious. And then the last unit is verses 11 to 18, and twice he says, Verse 11 and verse 14, I am the good shepherd. And he tells us what that means. That's the text. Now, here's a way to sum it up. I'm still on summary, big overview here. You can sum it up this way. In verses one to six, Jesus is gathering a flock. I am gonna say the shepherd is Jesus here, even though he didn't say that. I'm gonna say that. He's gathering a flock in verses one to six. He's calling them by name in the fold of Israel and his sheep are hearing his voice and they're following. That's what he's doing as he goes around on the planet. I'm gathering a people. He's doing that now in this room. He's calling. His voice is being heard by some, not by others. I pray that you're in the first category. You should pray that you're in the first category. The second unit, seven to 10, he's explaining why he's gathering a flock, namely that they might have life and have it abundantly, verse 10. So that he's gathering a flock, verses seven to 10, why is he gathering a flock? To give them life and life abundant. Now the third unit is verses 11 to 18, and he answers the question, how are you gathering a flock and giving those sinners life abundant? Answer, by laying down his life for them. That's the text. That's the unit, that's the way it works. He's gathering sheep. Why? To give them life. How? By laying down his life for them and taking it back again so can he, he can be their 21st century shepherd. Now, oh, how much more there is to see. <laughs> That's good. We could stop here. You just go home and mull on that for a few hours like I did all day Friday. How much more there is to see in this text. So let's take these one at a time. Before we do the first unit, remember he's talking to the Pharisees. This is really important. He's talking to the Pharisees. Others are listening in. We know that from verse 21. To show you that he's talking to the Pharisees, look at the bridge between chapter nine and chapter 10. Namely, there isn't one. You don't need a bridge where there's no break. Forget chapter divisions, they weren't there when John wrote this. So let's, let's pick it up where he left off and just forget the chapter division, listen carefully. Verse 40 of chapter nine. <clears throat> Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you'd have no guilt. 
But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter, by the sheep, enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man's a thief and a robber. There's just no doubt here what's going on. They're the sheep and the robber. <clears throat> That's what he's saying. You're the sheep and the robber. You got into your positions without going through the gatekeeper. You don't have the blessing of God on your life. You are holding your Pharisaic authority for envious reasons. That's why you're going to kill me. You're a stranger in this fold. That's why it's important to see that he's talking to the Pharisees. There's no break here. Verse 5, look at verse 5. A stranger, they, they referring to the people that I'm calling by name that are following me, a stranger they will not follow. They will not follow. They will flee from him. For they don't know the voice of strangers. So the sheep that belong to the true shepherd, that hear the voice of the shepherd, say, that's the, that's, I've been waiting all my life for this. There he is. They won't be controlled by the Pharisees. They know Jesus. They can smell it. Taste it. Hear it. See it. Verse 2, he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. I'm saying that's Jesus. I hope you agree. He doesn't say that yet. He says it later. To him the gatekeeper opens. I think that's God. I won't argue the point. It may just be parabolic color. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. He leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, so he's gathering sheep within the fold of Israel. He's calling his own. I hope you're part of that. He goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. You know his voice? You read the Bible, do you hear God Almighty talking to you, irresistibly drawing to you, making you say yes, 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 over again, over and over when you read the Bible, because you hear God, or don't you hear him? Is it a strange voice to you? Jesus had called the blind man to himself. The Pharisees were lousy shepherds. Jesus said in another place, they load men with heavy burdens and they don't lift one finger to help them. That's not what a shepherd does. They were supposed to be shepherds and they had crawled over the fence because they knew the gatekeeper wouldn't let them in with their hearts. But Jesus came through the gate and he's gathering a people. He calls his own by name, verse three. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. That's what Jesus was doing and that's what he's doing right now. In this room and where you sit. He is either insane, foolish, irrelevant, boring, mythological, or I can hear him. I'm going, I'm leaving. I'm leaving everything because that voice is the only voice I care about. Verse 6, he calls it a figure of speech. You see that? My question is, why did he tell this figure of speech to the Pharisees? Why? And my answer is to test them another time, give them another chance to not be blind. 
they had just said, we, we say, you say we see, you say we see, all right? Here's a figure of speech, what do you see? Here's what they saw, verse six. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. They didn't know what he was saying. They were blind. Though they say they see. Are you? What do you see in verses 1 to 6? They saw nothing. He's insane. How about you? How about you? Okay, there it is. He painted a picture for them. He left open for them to interpret. I've just interpreted. They understood nothing, John says. How will Jesus respond to the Pharisees? To you? Me. How does he respond? In one sense, in one way, you could say, well, he keeps on explaining. He unpacks it. Or, in another way, you could say, he makes himself look insane. And that's right. They're both right. And we've seen this before, haven't we? Chapter six, he calls himself in chapter six, you remember, the bread of life. I am a loaf of bread. Come down from heaven like manna landing in Jerusalem. And they take offense at this and say, he tells us he's bread. What does he do when they take offense at this word picture? He makes it gross. That's what he does. He says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. What do you make of that? And they gag in verses 60 to 61 of chapter 6. And he says back to them, that's why I said no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. Without the Father, you gag at my word pictures. You call me insane without my Father because you are so hostile to me. Our hearts are so different. In one sense, Jesus was making things clearer in verses 7 to 18. In another sense, he was making himself absurd. So let's watch him do this. He said, okay, you don't grasp my figure of speech? Here, try this. I am a door and I am a shepherd. Oh, watch yourself here because how quickly intelligent American readers say, mixed metaphor, doesn't work, foolish, insane, blew it, bad writing or bad speaking, watch out. Watch out, scholars. I'm the door, I'm the shepherd. Can't be a door shepherd. You're a door, you're a shepherd. Really? That's one response. The other response is, oh Jesus, 
Tell me about your doorness and tell me about your shepherdness. Unload on me all your doorness and unload on me all your shepherdness. I don't care about mixed metaphors. I want to hear doorness for me and shepherd for me. That's one kind of response. Where are you? Are you among the, the skeptics sniffing, sniffing? at Jesus? Or are you desperate? God, I need a door. I don't know where it's even going to go. I just know I need a door out of this mess of me. And if if I don't have a shepherd, I'm going to fall off a cliff and get myself eaten alive by some crazy crook. I need... So you're not... People like that aren't picking at Jesus. Okay, let's talk about the door. Verses 7 to 10. Jesus, tell me about your doorness. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. I think that means there were a lot of people, a lot of pretenders to give what I give. I, only I can give. There were there've been a lot of pretenders. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. That is, God's own didn't listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And he'll go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it Abundantly. This is saying exactly the same thing as John 14, 6, which lots of you know. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. Same idea. I'm the door. If you believe me, if you trust me to be the pathway to God, I promise you two things. You'll be safe, saved, and you go in and out with me at your head, and you'll find the greenest pastures and the sweetest waters you've ever known. Those are the two things I promise you, safety and plenty. That's what the door means. If you'll have me as your door, if you don't think you need a door, if you like the house you're in, the desert you're in, then, then you won't, you'll just see insanity here. I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. There are wolves in the world and they represent anything that can destroy you ultimately. And Jesus says, if you'll enter by me, I won't let them at you ever, ever. I will not let you be destroyed. You're mine. You are saved. Saved. You're safe. You're in the corral. You're in the fold. I'm not letting them in. I'm the shepherd. I'm not letting them in. I'm the door, and I'm not letting them in. They're not getting through. No, so much, so good, right? Everybody wants safety. Nobody wants to be destroyed. Common ground worldwide. Nobody wants to be destroyed. Common ground, he gives it, and he alone gives it. Now, he says, and, and the reason there's that, you might say, why is there a need to be an and? Well, because I want way more than to be safe, don't you? <laughs> Who cares about safe if there's nothing to be safe for? I don't want to just, I mean, Jesus, if you leave me safe in the corral, in the sheepfold, guess what? I starve. Safe from the wolves. I want pastures. I want water. I want to lie down in a soft place, not a dusty place. I want not just life, I want Finish it. Abundant life. 
That's the, that's the connection. Saved, go in and out and find pasture. I'll give them life and life that is abundant. You all know this. I mean, maybe we emphasize saved without this second piece, like, for what? Safe. Okay. Not going to hell. Now what? Boredom? No. No. In and out. In and out. Finding the greenest, sweetest, softest pasture for my soul that there could ever be because of my shepherd. Waters, still clean, pure waters from my soul. Abundant life, verse 10. Abundant life has nothing to do with having stuff. People with lots of stuff kill themselves often. We've seen some really tragic ones recently, haven't we? It isn't stuff. The pasture isn't stuff. Human beings are not like bees or beavers or rats, horde. This is not what we're for. We got souls in the image of God. I want beauty. I want people. I want relationships. I want peace. I want joy. I want weight in my life. I want satisfaction. These are things you can't quantify with stuff. In fact, the people with the most stuff generally struggle the most with lack of that. Life abundance is not about abundant stuff here. It's about peace with God. It's about a weight of glory. It's about knowing the one you were made for and having daily communion with your shepherd as you go in and out as he sees fit, into protection and into pasture. So thank you, Jesus, for being a door. And you remember I said verses 7 to 10 was answering the question, why are you gathering a flock? In verses 1 to 6, why are you gathering a flock? Answer, that they may have abundant life. Now, last question. How? How are you doing this? How are you doing this? Okay, here we are now at verses 11 to 18. Last unit. There is more here than can be fit into this sermon so my plan from the beginning was to preach again on verses 11 to 18, Lord willing, next week, especially verse 16. The verse written on a stone in Westminster Abbey over the grave of the explorer missionary David Livingstone, which has inspired so many missionaries. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. I'm reading his gravestone in the King James them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. That deserves a sermon. It is massively important. He has other sheep besides the ones coming from this Jewish fold. Like a room full here, I hope. Isn't that wonderful that he didn't restrict it to Israel in the end? Just flung the doors wide to all of us, scruffily, mangy. So that's next week. But let's, let's go with Jesus quickly, straight to where he's going. Namely, either I'm insane or I'm God. 
And let's just briefly answer the question, how are you going to gather a group of sinful people who then, in spite of their sin, have abundant life? How are you going to do that? Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. That's how he's going to do it. Now, look at, this is amazing. Jesus is as bound to his sheep as he is to his father, says. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. You sheep can no more be lost than God can be lost from Jesus. However, this is troubling. Think of it. Okay. These sheep need protection. This shepherd is going to lay down his life for the protection and for the plenty. You know what happens when a shepherd dies? The sheep die. Right? There's no protection. There's no guidance. They don't know where to go. The death of a shepherd is dangerous for the sheep. And of course, you're way ahead of me here. I know that. Which is why he says, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. And if I lay it down, I will take it again. This command I have from my father. My father loves you. He's not going to leave you without a shepherd. He has told me, son, you must die. Yes, father. But you don't stay dead. <laughs> you come back, and you come back quick because you're needed alive in the 21st century for Bethlehem Baptist Church. Big time, especially for this wavered under-shepherd here who gets himself in trouble way too many times. Needs a big kick in the heavenly rear. <laughs> so you come back, son, and, and of course, Jesus said, when I give my life, I'm taking it back. Which leaves us where we began. That's insane. Or, it's God. What a God. And the apex of this abundant life that he came back to secure is the worship of Jesus Christ. You believe that? I hope that's what your heart says. The apex, lots of good things in this life called abundant life, but the apex is Jesus. You are all to me. Seeing him, savoring him, treasuring him in worship, that's the apex of this life. When he says, I'm the door, I'm the shepherd, I have authority to lay down my life, I have authority to take it back, he's either insane talking like that, or he's worthy of your worship. These things are written, and I have now preached them, that you may believe. So I, I plead with you, all of you, come to him as your door to God. Come to him as your shepherd for the provision and the guidance and the safety and the abundance that you so long for. And come to him as your life.
We worship you, Lord Jesus. We worship you. You are our God, our Savior, our provider, our door, our shepherd. Call forth now by your voice, wherever people are sitting, call forth by your voice, by the Spirit, faith and worship, I pray. Amen.